Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be doing a podcast on losing a loved one. So I've hinted that I was going through something in the uh, last couple of podcasts I did. I started doing one only two a week. Well, I started that a while ago, but only one a week. And I just want to get this out, get this over with, and maybe help other people in certain cases so my mother was rushed to the hospital in the middle of the night and was unresponsive for several weeks in the hospital and passed away so in memory of my mother margie Olsis, or as she liked to be called later in her life <laughs> marguerite delutri or delutro to all those we've loved and are no longer with us on this journey. My thoughts are with you. However, in doing these podcasts, and one of the major traumas in my life was losing my fiance, and I did a podcast playlist, and it's called Foundations of Wellness, and that was the promise I made to her. And I want, every once in a while, I want to do things like this to put into that playlist, and I have skipped doing science ones for a while. And things have been tough. My I just, my head hasn't been in the game. But I want to do something on how to deal with bereavement, um, grief, loss of a loved one. <clears throat> and there's plenty of tips, and there'll be links, as always, in the description. I'll put the links for the websites. And within these websites have links for, like, losing the, uh, a pet, um, you know. And believe it or not, we humans have this weird affinity to become attached, even like movie stars or a music artist. And it can affect us all in different ways. Uh, I don't know if, if grieving really affects everybody the same, you know. And I can go through some things and describe like what I feel was worse for me and everything. But as of right now, I just wanted to get that out of the way. So I'll start with helpguide.org. And the title of the article is Bereavement, Grieving the Loss of a Loved One. As always, I'll probably read these word for word, and then I'll interject a couple of things. And when I end it, I might talk about a thing I do called the construct and how I deal with my own type of things. So let's see, does this have a author? I like to give credit. Um, Lawrence Robinson and Melinda Smith, M.A. All right, so I'll start. Few things can compare to the pain of losing someone you love. While there's no way to avoid intense feelings of grief, there are healthier ways to come to terms with your loss. What is bereavement? Bereavement is the grief and mourning experience following the death of someone important to you. While it's an inevitable part of life, something that virtually all of us go through at some point, Losing someone you love can be one of the most painful experiences you'll ever have to endure. Whether it's a close friend, spouse, partner, parent, child, or other relative, the death of a loved one can feel overwhelming. You may experience waves of intense and very difficult emotions, ranging from profound sadness, emptiness, and despair, to shock, numbness, guilt, or regret. You might rage at the circumstances of your loved one's death. Your anger focused on yourself, doctors, or loved ones, or God. You may even find it difficult to accept the person is really gone, or struggle to see how you can ever recover and move on from your loss. Bereavement isn't limited to emotional responses either. Grief at the death of a loved one can also trigger physical reactions including weight and appetite changes, difficulty sleeping, aches and pains, and an impaired immune system leading to illness and other health problems. The level of support you have around you, your personality, your own levels of health and well-being can all play a role in how grief impacts you following bereavement. But no matter how much pain you're in right now, it's important to know that there are healthy ways to cope with the anguish and come to terms with your grief. While life may never be quite the same again, in time, you can ease your sorrow 
start to look to the future with hope and optimism, and eventually move forward with your life. Now here's an insert into this article. As I said, in the description will be the links to the websites I go through, and it's called, there's a link here, Grieving the Loss of a Pet. Bereavement isn't restricted to the death of a person. For many of us, our pets are as close companions or family members, or also close companions or family members. So when a pet dies, you can experience similar feelings of grief, pain, and loss. As with grieving for humans and loved ones, healing from the loss of an animal companion takes time. But there are ways to cope with your grief. And there's a link to coping with losing a pet. I'll continue. Understanding the grief of losing a loved one. The intensity of your feeling often depends on the circumstances of your loved one's death, how much time you spent anticipating their loss, your relationship to them, and your previous experiences of bereavement. Of course, just as no two relationships are the same, no two losses are ever the same either. In short, the more significant the person was in your life, and the more feelings you had for them, regardless of their relationship to you, the greater impact their loss is likely to have. Losing a spouse or partner. In addition to the emotional impact of grief when you lose a spouse or romantic partner, you often have to deal with the stress of practical considerations such as funeral arrangements and financial issues too. You may also have to explain your spouse's death to your children and find a way to comfort them while simultaneously dealing with your own heartache. Losing a romantic partner also means grieving the loss of your daily lifestyle, the loss of a shared history, and the loss of a future planned together. You may also feel alone, despairing, and worried about the future. You could even feel guilty about somehow having to fail to protect your partner or angry at your loved one for leaving you. Losing a parent. For younger children, Losing a mother or father can be one of the most traumatic things that could happen in childhood. The death of the person you relied on, the person who loved you unconditionally, can shake your foundations and leave a huge, frightening void in your world. It is also common for young children to blame themselves for a parent's death, prolonging the pain of grief. Even as an adult child, losing a parent can be extremely distressing. It's easy to feel lost and for all those old childhood insecurities to suddenly return. You may find some solace if your partner had a long, if your parent had a long and fulfilling life, but the death can also cause you to consider your own mortality. If you've lost both parents, you're suddenly part of the older generation, a generation without parents, and you're left to grieve your youth as well. And if your relationship with your parent wasn't an easy one, their death can leave you wrestling with a host of conflicting emotions. Losing a child. The loss of a child is always devastating. You're not just losing the person they were, you're also losing the years of promise, hopes, and dreams that lay ahead. The grief can be more intense, the bereavement process harder to navigate, and the trauma more acute. As a parent, you feel responsible for your child's health and safety, so the sense of guilt can often be overwhelming. Whether you lost your child in a miscarriage, as an infant, or after they've grown up and left home, losing a child carries an additional weight of injustice. It feels unnatural for a parent to outlive their child, making it that much harder to find meaning and come to terms with their death. Losing a child can also put a huge strain on your relationship with your spouse or partner and make parenting any surviving children emotionally challenging. Losing a friend. Close friendships bring joy, understanding, and companionship into our lives. In fact, they're vital to our health and well-being. So it's no wonder we can feel their loss so gravely. When a close friend dies, though, It's easy to feel marginalized, the closeness of your relationship not given the same significance as a family member or romantic partner. This can lead to what's called disenfranchised grief, 
where your loss is devalued or you feel judged or stigmatized for feeling the loss so deeply. There's a little blurb here with a link. Losing someone to suicide. The shock following a suicide can seem overwhelming. As well as mourning the loss of your loved one, you may also be struggling to come to terms with the nature of their death and the stigma that suicide can still carry. While you may always be left with some unanswered questions about your loved one's suicide, there are ways to resolve your grief and even gain some level of acceptance. And there's a link to suicide grief. You know, it's fucking ironic since I'm going through this. You know, my mom died, you know, a couple of weeks, a week ago, too. And my fiance, who fought cancer for 13 years, we were together for 17 um, when she died of cancer. Before her cancer started, we lost the baby. So, like, you know, life isn't easy. Just, I think, what is it, uh, Rocky? It's not about how many times you get knocked down. It's about getting back up. Anyway, I'll continue. Uh, yeah, there was a little blur for losing someone to suicide. Next is grieving your loss. Whatever your relationship to the person who died, it is important to remember that we all grieve in different ways. There's no single way to react. When you lose someone important in your life, it's okay to feel how you feel. Some people express their pain by crying. Others never shed a tear. But that doesn't mean they feel the loss any less. Don't judge yourself. Think that you should be behaving in a different way or try to impose a timetable on your grief. Grieving someone's death takes time. For some people, that time is measured in weeks or months. For others, it is years. Allow yourself to feel. The bereavement and mourning process can trigger many intense and unexpected emotions. But the pain of your grief won't go away faster if you ignore it. In fact, trying to do so may only make things worse in the long run. To eventually find a way to come to terms with your loss, you need to actively face the pain. As bereavement counselor and writer Earl Grohman put it, the only cure for grief is to grieve. Grief doesn't always move through stages. You may have read about the different stages of grief. Usually denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. However, many people find that grief following the death of a loved one isn't nearly that predictable. For some, Grief can come in waves or feel more like an emotional roller coaster. For others, it can move through some stages but not others. Don't you think that you should be feeling a certain way at a certain time? Or don't think that you should be feeling a certain way at a certain time? Prepare for painful reminders. Some days the pain of your bereavement may seem more manageable than others. Then a reminder such as a photo a piece of music, or a simple memory can trigger a wave of painful emotions again. While you can't plan ahead for such reminders, you can be prepared for an upcoming holiday, anniversary, or birthday that may may reignite your grief. Talk to other friends and family ahead of time and agree on the best ways to mark such occasions. Moving on doesn't mean forgetting your loved one. Finding a way to continue forward with your life doesn't mean your pain will end or your loved one will be forgotten. Most of us carry our losses with us throughout life. They become part of who we are. The pain should gradually become easier to bear, but the memories and the love you had for the person will always remain. Seek support. When you lose someone you love, it's normal to want to cut yourself off from others and to retreat into your shell. But this is no time to be alone. Even when you don't feel able to talk about your loss, simply being around other people who care about you can provide comfort and help ease the burden of bereavement. Reaching out to those who care about you can also be an important first step on the road to healing. While some friends and relatives may be uncomfortable with your grief, plenty of others will be eager to lend support. Talking about your thoughts and feelings won't make you a burden. Rather, it can help you make sense of your loved one's death and find ways to honor their memory. 
lean on friends and family. Even those closest to you can struggle to know how to help during a time of bereavement. So don't hesitate to tell others what you need, whether it's helping with funeral arrangements or just being around to talk. If you don't feel you have anyone you can lean on for support at this difficult time, look to widen your social network and build new friendships. Focus on those who are good listeners. When you're grieving the loss of a close friend or family member, the most important thing is to feel heard by those you confide in. But the raw emotion of your grief can make some people very uncomfortable. That discomfort can cause them to avoid you, say thoughtless or hurtful things, or lose patience when you talk about your loss. Don't use their actions as a reason to isolate, though. Turn, those, turn to those who are better able to listen and provide comfort. Join a bereavement support group. Even when you have support from those closest to you, friends and family may not always know the best way to help. Sharing your grief with others who have experienced similar losses can help you feel less alone in your pain. By listening to others share their stories, you can also gain valuable coping tips. To find a support group in your area, contact nearby hospitals, funeral homes, or counseling centers, or call a bereavement hotline listed below. As I said, I'll put the link in the descriptions. They'll be, you'll see the links if you need them. Talk to a bereavement counselor. If you're struggling to accept your loss or your grief feels overwhelming, try talking to a bereavement or grief therapist in person or via video conferencing online. Confiding in a professional can help you work through emotions that may be too difficult to share with family or friends. Deal with any resolved issues from your loved one's death and find healthier ways to adapt to life following your loss. Draw comfort from your religion. If you're religious, the specific rich mourning rituals of your faith can provide comfort and draw you together with others to share your grief. Attending religious services, reading spiritual texts, praying, meditating, or talking to a clergy member can also offer great comfort and help you derive meaning from your loved one's death. There's another insert, using social media for grief support. Memorial pages on Facebook and other social media sites have become popular ways to inform a wide audience of a loved one's passing and to find support, as well as allowing you to impart practical information, such as funeral plans, these pages allow friends and loved ones to post their own tributes or condolences. Reading such messages can for, provide comfort for those grieving the loss. Of course, posting sensitive content on social media has its risk. Memorial, memorial pages are often open to anyone. This may encourage people who hardly knew the deceased to pull well-meaning but inappropriate comments or advice. Worse, memorial pages can also attract internet trolls. There have been many well-publicized cases of strangers posting cruel or abusive messages on memorial pages. <laughs> it's so funny that they have to include that, right? Um, to gain some protection on Facebook, for example, you can opt to create a closed group rather than a public page. And you can have settings on it where you, uh, you, people have to be approved by a group member before they can access the memorial. Um, it's also re useful to remember that while social media can be a useful tool for reaching out to others, it can't replace face-to-face -face support you need at this time. I'll continue. Celebrate your loved one's life. Rituals such as a funeral or memorial service can fulfill important functions, allowing you to acknowledge and reflect on the person's passing, remember their life, and say goodbye. In the period after a funeral, however, your grief can often become even more intense. Often, other people may appear to have moved on while you're left struggling to make sense of your new normal. Remembering your loved one doesn't have to end with the funeral, though. Finding ways of celebrating the person you loved can help maintain their memory and provide comfort as you move through the grieving process. And they give some tips. Keep a journal or write a letter to your loved one. Saying the things you never got to say to your loved one in life 
can provide an important emotional release and help you make sense of what you're feeling. Create a memorial. Building a memorial to your loved one, creating a website or blog, or compiling a photo album or scrapbook to highlight the love you share can help promote healing. Planting flowers or a tree in your loved one's memory can be particularly rewarding, allowing you to watch something grow and flourish as you tend to it. Build a legacy. Starting a campaign or fundraiser in your loved one's own name, volunteering for a cause that was important to them, or donating to a charity they supported, for example, can help you find meaning in their loss. It can also add a sense of purpose as you move forward with your own life. Continue to do things you used to do together. Perhaps you used to go to sports events with your loved one, listen to music, or take long walks together. There's comfort in routine. So when it's not too painful, continuing to do these things can be a way to mark your loved one's life. Remember your loved one in simple ways. Even simple acts such as lighting a candle, visiting a favorite place, or marking an important date can help the healing process. Take care of yourself. When you're grieving the death of a loved one, it's easy to neglect your own health and welfare. But the stress, trauma, and intense emotions you're dealing with at the moment can impact your immune system, affect your diet and sleep, and take a heavy toll on your overall mental and physical health. Neglecting your well-being may even prolong the grieving process and make you more susceptible to depression or complicated grief. You'll also find it harder to provide comfort to children or other vulnerable family members who are also grieving. However, there are simple steps you can take to nurture your health at this time. Manage stress. It is probably the last thing you feel like doing at the moment, but exercising is a powerful antidote to stress and can help you sleep better at night. Relaxation techniques such as deep breathing, meditation, and yoga are also effective ways to ease anguish and worry. Spend time in nature. Immersing yourself in nature and spending time in green spaces can be a calming, soothing experience when you're grieving. Try gardening, hiking, or walking in a park or woodland. Pursue interests that enrich your life. Hobbies, sports, and other interests that add meaning and purpose to your life can bring a comforting routine back to your life following the upheaval of bereavement. They can also help connect you with others and nurture your spirit. Eat and sleep well. Eating a healthy diet and getting enough rest at night can have a huge impact on your ability to cope with grief. If you're struggling to sleep at this difficult time, there are supplements and sleep aids that may be able to help. Just try not to rely on them for too long. Avoid alcohol or drug use to cope. <laughs> While it's tempting to use substances to help numb your grief and self-medicate your pain, in the long run, excessive alcohol and drug use will only hamper your ability to grieve. Try using Help Guide's free Emotional Intelligence Toolkit as a healthier way to manage your emotions. And there's a link. You hit it, it's an underlined. When the pain of bereavement doesn't ease up, you may never truly get over the death of someone you love. But as time passes, it's normal for difficult emotions such as sadness or anger to gradually ease as you begin to accept your loss and move forward with your life. However, if you aren't feeling better over time, or your pain is getting worse, it may be a sign that your grief has developed into a more serious problem, such as complicated grief or major depression. Grief versus depression. Distinguishing between grief and depression isn't always easy, as they share many symptoms, but there are many, but there are ways to tell the difference. Grief can be a roller coaster. It involves a wide variety of emotions and a mix of good and bad days. Even when you're in the middle of the grieving process, you still have moments you will still have moments of pleasure or happiness. With depression, on the other hand, the feelings of emptiness and despair are constant. Again, there's a link, read depression symptoms, warning signs. 
Other symptoms that suggest depression, not just grief, include intense, pervasive sense of guilt, thoughts of suicide, or a preoccupation with dying, feeling of hopelessness or worthlessness, slow speech and body movements, inability to function at home, work, or school, seeing or hearing things that aren't there. What is complicated grief? While the sadness of losing someone you, you love never goes away completely, it shouldn't remain center stage. If the pain of the loss is so constant and severe that it keeps you from resuming your life, you may be suffering from a condition known as complicated grief or persistent complex bereavement disorder. Complicated grief is like being stuck in an intense state of mourning. You may have trouble accepting the death long after it has occurred or be so preoccupied with the person who died that it disrupts your daily routine and undermines your other relationships. Well, I could say that was probably me when Michelle died. <laughs> it took me five fucking years. Or something like that? I don't know. Complicated grief is... Oh, did I fucking say this again? <laughs> uh, okay. Symptoms of complicated grief include intense longing and yearning for your deceased loved one, intrusive thoughts or images of the person, denial of the death or sense of disbelief, imagining that your loved one is alive, Searching for the deceased in familiar places. Avoiding things that remind you of your loved one. Extreme anger or bitterness over your loss. Feeling that life is empty or meaningless. I don't know. <laughs> Imagine that your loved one's still alive. I don't know. I guess. I, I, I guess. I'll talk about my construct thing. But. Anyway, complicated grief and trauma. If your loved one's death was sudden, violent, or otherwise extremely stressful or disturbing, complicated grief can manifest as psychological trauma or PTSD. Being traumatized from the loss of a loved one can leave you feeling helpless and struggling with upsetting emotions, memories, and anxiety that won't go away. But with the right guidance, you can make healing changes and move on with your life. Finding professional help. If you're experiencing symptoms of complicated grief, trauma, or clinical depression, talk to a mental health professional right away. Left untreated, these conditions can lead to significant emotional damage, life-threatening health problems, and even suicide. But treatment can help you get better. Contact a bereavement counselor or therapist if you, one, feel like life isn't worth living, Wish you had died with your loved one. Blame yourself for the loss or for failing to prevent it. Feel numb and disconnected for more than a few weeks. Are having difficulty trusting others since your loss. Are unable to perform your normal daily activities. And at the bottom, there are bereavement resources and hotlines. Again, I say this a lot when I do these um Foundations for wellness, mental health is not something that should be made fun of, or I make it akin to going to the gym with your friend and you pump each other up, going to a therapist or a counselor, it's the same thing, it's or meditation and focusing, breathing, it's all reps, it's, it should be viewed the same way. So get help, do what you can, try your best, and talk to people, friends, good listeners, it's in this article. You can read it. Now, I was looking at um, one of the links because I, before I did this, I went through a couple of things, and it was um, coping with grief and loss. And it's the same thing. It's help guide um, grief, in, in in a sense, is is a natural response to loss. It's the emotional suffering you feel when something or someone you love is taken away. Often, the pain of loss can feel overwhelming. You may experience all kinds of difficult, unexpected emotions from shock or anger to disbelief, guilt, and profound sadness. The pain of grief can also disrupt your physical health, making it difficult to sleep, eat, or even think straight. 
These are normal reactions to loss, and the more significant the loss, the more intense your grief will be. Coping with the loss of someone or something you love is one of the life's biggest challenges. You may associate grieving with the death of a loved one, which is often the cause of the most intense type of grief. But any loss can cause grief, including divorce or relationship breakup, loss of health, losing a job, loss of financial stability, a miscarriage, retirement. God, I'm like the whole five for five right off the bat. <laughs> Death of a pet, loss of cherished dream, a loved one's serious illness, loss of a friendship, loss of safety after a trauma. Selling the family home. And this is the an article that goes through the grieving process. Um, has great tips in it. I'm going to put this in there too. It talks about the five stages of grief. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. And we mentioned that in the other one. But not that everybody goes through them in the same way. And it's, got a, it's the same website. So it's got great inserts on... You know, like the other one did, grief can be a roller coaster. There'll be links to things. I would read them, uh, even hit the links. And this is what's great about the internet age, and people can complain about it. But I've met friends that I love dearly, um, and it's not all toxic and venom filled. There's beauty, love, compassion intellect it's all out there and it's all out there in different numbers and different groups but we are humans and we have our tribes and our biases and all the cognitive fun craziness it'll also tell you about physical symptoms of grief or fatigue nausea lowered immunity weight loss aches and pains insomnia we talked about that um and this is a weird one because when you look at some of the things uh, that happen to you in life, like I can compare things, you know, I'm 50 years old now, so I had a friend kill himself in front of me, two feet away, less than two feet away maybe, with a gun, pointed it through his eye, out the back of his head, just fell to the ground. I loved him, he was one of my best friends. It happened when I was like 19 or 20, maybe 18. And when I look through my life and think on things and I do my construct, it's not as painful or as hurtful as, I'll put it in, try to, I don't want to compare it to my fiance because, you know, we were in a loving relationship, but let's say a friend who was dying of cancer or something. I think there is that, it's that shock of, you know, my friend killed himself in front of me. It was so quick in his trauma. But there's, I think, a difference. And, again, people are going to feel the same way. Some people are going to feel different. It's just not cookie-cutter for everybody. There's a lot of things you need to go through. And then there was another article I was looking at. Let me see if I can find it. Um, this was... Because I was deciding on what to post and how long this fucking podcast is going to be. How to deal with grief after a loved one's death. So it's tips from an expert. And, you know, I don't know if I... Well, hold on, let me take a quick look. What to expect soon after the death of a loved one, shock and numbness. Um, <clears throat> despite their best intentions, most people don't know what to say. Yeah, this is, these were just, uh, I was just wondering if there was something in here. I left it up for Amy Florian. So I guess that'll be mostly it. Um, as I've said before, all these I usually put in the description links to the articles I read. I try to give credit, and I think I did on the first one. And I'll end with 
talking about the construct, which I call, it's just a fucking technique I use. So every night before bed, and a lot of times in between when I'm going to practice um, lucid dreaming, God, I haven't been able to do that in so long. Well, not well, consistently. I either close my eyes or lay down. It's usually before bed all the time, almost every time unless I pass out. In my mind, I visualize a special place. For me, it's like a Gondor medieval castle. And I use my quantum bands. I'm usually in my Quasar-ish outfit, although it changes from time to time. And with the death of my mom, something changed immediately, because as I make my construct, she's there. That's never happened with anybody before. So in basic terms, I create my construct, I open a portal to this huge castle, I see the visual. Now, when I first started doing this, I would build it from the ground up. You know, go through stages of you know meditation and practice, but for the most part now, I open a portal, I go right in, and it's there that in this huge feasting hall, uh, everybody I have lost and loved on this journey, and that's where it usually starts. But ever since my mom's death, it's when I start to do my construct, she's there. I find it really. Interesting, because I know this is all me psychologically. I don't believe in the afterlife and religious and religion and stuff like that. But I think it's telling that um, she's there for me to start this journey again. And so what I do is I go to this feasting hall. And usually it starts with my grandmother and grandfather on my mother's side. My grandmother and grandfather on my father's side. And they say hello to them and... Hug them all. And then my Aunt Margaret, and Aunt Debbie, Uncle Tommy. And as I'm going through this process, I'm bringing in my Aunt Dee, my brother, my nephews, um, my cousins, Tony and Thomas, Mallory, Nikki. And I intermingle them. Sometimes they come in and come out. Um, Nikki had... Uh, Baby Gianna, I can introduce her to my grandmother and my nephews, same thing. And it's always a eating and drinking, cheering, that type of thing. And then I turn to my friends and in this I say, you know, ha, hello and hug my friends. And it's usually Philip and Larry. And it's the people who impact me that come from recent things a lot. So it'll be Kino, Mark, Albert. And, of course, Junior, Arrow, Joe, another Joe, John, Peter. And with this side of the crowd, I usually light up my quantum bong and we smoke a joint and smoke a blunt. And as I go through this, I decide at certain times what I need. So, if I want to talk to my grandmother on my father's side, because I didn't... No, my grandmother on my mother's side. It usually changes to the living room where I grew up with my grandmother. It's usually a backgammon game. She's holding a cigarette in her hand. Her lips are pursed tight in a tight line. And she's watching you. And I will talk to them. And I will tell them the things that I didn't get to say. And have conversations with them. And I want to recognize and always remind myself of why I am the way I am because of them and how they impacted my life and the parts of me that are, I carry around that are them. And this can work in weird ways, especially with like friends and family. All right, so I have a friend in my construct. His name is Mickey. I met him once, or maybe twice, and spoke to him once. And he showed up in the construct out of nowhere this wasn't a consider a friend friend like i didn't know him i spoke to him once maybe he was in his vicinity once but the reason why he showed up in there was because of how much i love my friend justin he's a brother to me he's the best friend i've had in maybe my life and that impact on him i felt so profoundly that Subconsciously, I didn't mean to do it. He appeared there, 
And I, Justin came in and gave a hug, and he said the things that he couldn't say to him. And these things are, I think, therapeutic. It's sometimes it's grieving, and you know, and but I try to transform all that. Take all those feelings, do breathing techniques, smooth it out, and then reinforce it with the positive. So it always ends with smiling and saying, I'm sorry, I'll do better, or thank you, and hugs. It's always forgiveness and love. And when I'm done with that, it could be various. Like I said, it could be, oh, I need to talk to this friend and say this, or I need the comfort of my grandmother because my grandmother and my father, so I was... My grandparents and my father are the best fucking parents ever. I know we all can say that. But holy shit. They were amazing. And I would go there afterwards and talk. Because my mother got about mentally ill around when I was about 13. I started recognizing it fully. So there's that. And it all comes together depending on how I'm feeling and what's going into the day. But I then move on to this platform that will raise me into the tower where I do my work, and my work is all the stories I'm writing, the scripts, the adventures, and at some some points in my life, I was running three adventures a week, writing a book, writing a script, you know, so I go up into my platform, and here's where I visit, or the the loves of my life visit me, so first it's Liz, and then it's, well, sometimes it's like, I think Mary, I was like five years old with the teacups, I don't know why, but sometimes that'll happen. But it's usually first Liz, and then it's Valerie, then it's Marie, and Tatiana, and and, um, of course it usually ends with Michelle, the latest love, the one who uh, was with for like 17 years, and 13 of those years were fighting cancer, who I just told today, we lost a baby, um, before she found out she had cancer, it kind of led to it. And here's why I say to them and learned throughout my life that I will turn all of it into goodness and happy thoughts, the memories. I don't care at the time how bad I felt when me and Liz broke up or me and Val. And I love them. They gave me huge parts of me, of my life, and awesome memories. And some bad, some good, so what? Awesome people, and I love them all. And I usually hug uh, Michelle, and I. It started to transform into them becoming Green Lanterns, or uh, there's a lant- there's a spectrum of the lanterns, and they uh, one is like violet is love, and blue is hope, and that's what they've become eventually. Where I have to let them go, and they open a portal, and I spread love throughout the universe. Sometimes I go on adventures with them, like when my mom passed away, we went to solar systems, and we stopped. Um, uh, a galactic villain, we stopped uh, solar radiation, and I bring some of my loved ones here and there. So as I'm getting this day, other things started to happen, where when Stan Lee died, he appeared on my dais. And it was here that I started recognizing that as I prepare to go into my workplace, it's the creative people, even if I didn't know them. And by the way, throughout this whole process, which doesn't take that long if you really think about it. All my friends and family are filtering through. It's Justin, Eddie, Rob, Scott, Gary, like Al. It just Steve. It, I don't want to miss you know not miss your name, but at some point, all the people I love who are part of me, who have impacted my life, come through my construct in various ways. And it's usually the last portion where I say goodbye to Michelle. I go up the dais with. Stanley and you know if it's other people um, who I've loved and you know feel a closeness to, I get up to my certain room. Other people get off at certain spots and they have their own D and D places. And Larry will be there sometimes, and we'll go over my book or talking. I go up to my room on top, <clears throat> and it's filled with like comic book you know panels like Shield or Iron Man, and there I just start going through all my adventures and. That's not the real important part, but <clears throat> as I started and talked to my family members and the friends I've lost, since I don't believe in the afterlife and all these, I think, are silly beliefs and a, a kind of a detriment to humanity now, maybe they weren't back then, it allows me to recognize that 
they impacted me. They are a part of me. They will always um, be a part of the process that brings the momentum of any change I make. It's if it's not the mannerisms I picked up, it's the way of thinking and talking. Uh, the, my grandmother on my um, father's side, as I got older, I went to visit her one day, and I said to her, you don't play get backgammon no more. Why don't we play? She goes, oh, you want to play? She pulled out the backgammon, put it up, and set everything up, and she did the patented elbow on the table, cigarette, I think it was a Peel's beer, <laughs> and she stared at me, and we stared at each other for what seemed like an eternity. And as I was doing this, I had, for the last year or two, I don't know how long it was exactly, but because of my mother's mental health issue, I started reading books on psychology, neurology, mental health, evolutionary biology, evolution, psychology, how magicians fool you, mentalists. And what I realized is, because I don't even know if my, my mother could have, my grandmother could have been like a, a psychiatrist. Like, I don't know. But what I realized is whether she knew it or not, that's how she delved into her family members and the people around her. It was she would ask you questions and watch your responses, and she knew what your eyes looking away meant. All these things that people train and learn, and like a grandmother can learn that, and it becomes part of who she is and how she educates and, um, you know, nourishes the family members. And she was the best. And that backgammon game that day, we never played again, and we didn't even play that day because it got into a weird thing where. You know, we're talking about my mom being mentally ill or whatever, and I'm, uh, we were talking about the, what I was learning, and I didn't say it directly to her, but I always admired that about her. And I started doing that after she moved to start now with my Aunt Kathy, and I cherish those moments. Uh, I think it started with my Aunt Margaret also. Um, it was kind of a weird thing, because her grandmother was always the staple. You always go to every... Um, Every, you know, for the holidays when you're growing up, and it becomes a natural point. But my Aunt Margaret, who was my blood uncle's wife, uh, fuck it, whatever, she's my Aunt Margaret. I had seen her by accident once, going to visit a friend. And I found myself passing by all the time, waiting to see her. And it's weird because there's a certain relationship you have who... I told my friend Demi how important she was in the sense that she's a new friend and we met online, we never met in person, but she doesn't treat me the same way everybody else does. So, for instance, I've been through so much, I've described a lot of things, you can go look. I get treated with kids' gloves a lot. I know it's not done on purpose, but people are anticipating my state of mind. My, you know worried about me in a loving way so they will act differently towards me and I think I cherish uh, the relationship with Demi because we have a similar she's much younger but she I think she understands better in a certain way that I don't need that and I think that's important too and I think Aunt Margaret was that she had this way of speaking to you getting to the point but uh, I have a new value, sort of. It's like truth over feelings, and I so love that. Which you might not get from your grandma, you know what I mean? Like, your aunt or uncle's the one who's going to smoke with you for the first time. I think it's that type of thing. And what I'm getting to is, my constructs, all my meditation techniques, the breathing techniques, are meant to embrace the people we are with now, recognize how much they mean to us, and the people we lost, yeah, maybe I don't believe in heaven, but they're never gone for me. They'll always be remembered. I'll go on adventures with them at night. I'll talk to them and speak to them. And I make sure that every time we interact in any way, I transform and I smooth out and turn everything into positive. And you train yourself enough to do this, it can help. So when that thought of your mom, your loved one, your pet comes to mind, you will train yourself to immediately recognize that feeling and it'll turn into a smile on your face and 
a good feeling. And it's work. Look, this is not easy. I'm, I, I'm a mess. Uh, I'm a fucking damaged individual. But I just happen to be a little bit more introspective than maybe some people. I know a little bit more about psychology. And like I said, and I could evaluate myself better and help people. But you got people with PhDs are fucking numbskulls and schmucks and believe in the stupidest things and act like assholes, monsters. So... The human condition is varied and so wild. And taming the frontiers of the mind I think is important, so I will totally recommend learning about breathing meditation techniques, even yoga. And as I mentioned in here, does religion have a part to play? I don't think so anymore, but it does to other people. And as long as the fucking religion as a whole isn't covering up fucking rape, and injustices that should have been closed down, I'm okay with it. Just like I'm okay with anybody believing what they want in their own fucking head. But once you put your beliefs out there, they can be ridiculed. And in short, I'll end this now by saying, grieving the loss of a loved one is a process we all go through. We might not all handle it in different way, you know, the same way, or it may not affect us differently. Talk about it, just like you would with working out, just like you would with um, trauma, going to the doctor. Uh, there was one thing I read about treating a breakup like you would a broken arm. And I think that might be overstated. It might be like a deepity type thing, but there's some value in it. There's some truth. I really wish I could hug the people again, and I do my best in my mind to bring out the smells and the locations. And you miss that tactile thing, but ever since my fiancé passed away, I've been so walled off, closed. I don't hug. I love hugging, and it's so therapeutic. I couldn't hug nobody. I still can't. I can't make certain connections. I don't know if I will ever love again in that same way. So I recognize many of these things that are my problems and are part of who I am now. What I've done, what I've decided to do, how I'm living my life, um, the years of not taking care of myself, 17 fucking years, it's just, you know, it can be overwhelming and talk to people, reach out, I'm here, my friends are here, I implore you all to look for professionals if that's what it means for you, but losing the loss of a loved one is not the end and it's hard. And I wish you all the best. I hope this in some way helps. There's so much going through my mind when I do something like this. And it's one thing for me. I breathe. I do exercises. But, you know, to face the reality, you accept the things, you know, the death, the moving on. Like, what does it all mean? And that's the challenges of life. And it's the, you know, way we are as a social creature. I think my views recently and the way I live my life is a good one in the sense where I try to treat humanity as I love everybody at a base value. Everybody. And then I train myself to do that so I don't have any biases in that certain sense. But the more I learn, the more I know, that changes it. So that is a definite value but it comes with a cost and an understanding that the reason why I know about you now and my biases and my understanding changes is because you've affected me. And that is important. Like I said, that's why people who watch actors and artists become so attached. They die. They feel like they lost a loved one and it's family. We have these attachments and I don't want anybody to feel... If something happens to me that there's anything other than joy and love, maybe at a time there was regrets, like I have been through some shit and, you know, I kind of had regrets, but if something were to happen to me tomorrow and everybody to dance and laugh and listen to music, smoke weed, have fun, know that it might have been tough, but I smile every day, I find happiness in moments. And I love everybody. Unless I know you well enough that I fucking find out some bullshit. And I'm going to make fun of you. 
and your stupid beliefs. Anyway, I think we've gone on long enough. This might have been a special, a weird podcast in a sense. It's a lot of me going over things that I didn't get to say over the last couple of weeks, and it might be a long one, but what are you going to do? All my fans are going to be upset. Oh, no, it's not a 13 minute. Oh, my fans, they keep sending me fucking mail and commenting. I'm going to have to put a kibosh on that. Anyway, I wish you all the best. I'm here for anybody if you need me. I love you all. Till next time, take care.